All right, so those unfamiliar uh, with uh, our sponsor, uh, Living Computers Museums and Labs, uh, they are a uh, technology museum here in Seattle in the Soto area, uh, kind of down by the stadiums. Um, Keith is one of uh, seven different uh, engineers that restore vintage systems, uh, ranging from the 19, uh, late, well, the late 50s and early 60s um, all the way to today. So uh, kind of a neat uh, place to be. Um, he will be joining us shortly on stage here and be talking about Tennis for Two, which is arguably one of the first video games uh, and that process of how he uh, recreated. All right. All right, welcome to our second panel of the day here, which is Recreating Tennis for Two with Keith Hayes. Uh, my name is Rob Schmuck. I'm the Director of Programming for Seattle Retro. Um, and as my day job, I actually work with Keith um, at Living Computers Museums and Labs and gets to see all the cool stuff that he is uh, currently working on. So uh, Tennis for Two is a project he undertook um, kind of late last year. Um, and then he's currently also restoring a computer space, uh, which is pretty exciting too. So that will be joining uh, the floor soon. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Keith here. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, very good. Uh, if you can't, raise your hand or something. Yes, I had the opportunity uh, about a year ago, I was tasked with uh, re recreating Tennis for Two, which is arguably the first video game to some people. Uh, it depends how you define video games. Yeah. But basically, uh, I agree with that assessment. And the reason I do it um, has a lot of features. There's a version that's working out by the front door it, ha you know, it uses user input, it's got a screen. It has the elements that we typically think of as in a video game for probably the first time. And when was this done? It was done way back in 1958. Uh, there were no microprocessors. There really wasn't any digital logic to speak of anywhere. Uh, it was all tubes, no, semiconductors were brand new. Uh, there were some used in this design that aren't used anymore. They were ger based on germanium that was only used for a few years. So what happened? Um, and is, uh, who, who's Willie Higginbotham? Well, he's the engineer that came up with the idea and he's credited with, with, with it. Now, I happen to know, doing the work myself here, that uh, he had a technician named Robert Dvorak who did really the work. And so I thought to myself, is, does Willie really deserve the credit he uh, gets for designing this game? And I actually came to the conclusion he does. Uh, because um, the technology to actually implement the game had already been around for about 10 years. There's a key component that's called an operational amplifier, I'll describe it later, that's essential for uh, operation of the game, and that had been around for quite a while, so Willie did come up with an idea on the back, literally on the back of a napkin, over lunch, and it was put together for their open house at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And the reason it was done, because they couldn't show what they were working on, it was all top secret, having to do with nuclear defense. And, but, with the game itself, since it used technology that everybody was pretty much familiar with, didn't reveal any secrets and they could um, get by with it. Um, I have to show you where it is in this picture. Uh, there'll be another slide that shows it better, but it's, uh, I'll have to stand up here. Yeah, over to the left of the screen where I pointed, you see an oscilloscope, and underneath the oscilloscope, there's a uh, curtain that's holding about 250 pounds of electronics. Um, and what was key to the game was a thing called an analog computer. It's totally unlike anything we think of as a computer now. But the word computer actually is a rather broad definition, anything that computes. And back in this time, using an analog computer to simulate real-world events instead of com computing them was a lot faster, more accurate, really, at the time, though it had its limits, and uh, was a way to solve a lot of problems that really couldn't be solved any other way at the time. 
Yep. Let's go back a little bit. I put the slides together more to remind myself to stay on track. Um, by the way, I won't be giving, I'm going to try not to give any lecture on how electronics work. I'm trying to keep it very simple so everybody can understand, but if you have questions later, please feel free to bring them up. And uh, so they use this device over here, and what it is, it's got various modules that perform mathematical functions, so you can simulate real-world physics with it, such as the bouncing of a tennis ball. Okay. And that computer they used was a Donner Model 30, which I find no information about other than this picture. Uh, okay. Come on. Somehow, oh, okay. Huh. Okay, there's a little more information on it. Um, key is reset and hold circuits for five integrators. So that'll be coming up. And over on the next slide, I see we have a, a zoomed picture of what I was pointing at. Um, I spent quite a bit of time trying to find the model of oscilloscope by enlarging this picture up really big and, and, and surfing the net, and I finally did identify it. I'm currently trying to restore one of these for the game, but uh, that'll be a story in itself near the end of this talk. Okay, getting back here. Okay. I was given the task to reproduce this design, yeah, but the problem is the design doesn't exist anymore. As soon as the uh, open house was complete, the, the uh, system was dismantled, and the only schematics that we have were made from memory. And that's a lot different than getting schematics from something that actually works. If you get something that was drawn up, which is as built, very important term for an engineer, that's going to describe exactly what was done. And maybe if there's a mistake in there, that's okay. You can see, oh, this is a little mistake. This line's supposed to go oh, for, from here to here instead of from there to there, and everything works. Well, when you do things from memory, you can lead, make big mistakes. And um, I got into the schematic, and I did find some issues. Basically, I was given the job to reproduce the game, but since none of the original equipment existed, and since things are simply not done that way anymore, I was given the freedom to do it any way I wanted to do it. So I made the decision that I would use modern electronic th parts, you know, as brand new, but I would follow the philosophy and make the game work from, a, uh, the, from a, the inside workings of the game are exactly the same. They use the same concepts as the original game did. So, um, to do that, I had to study these schematics. Yep, wrong way. And this is one of the two first, one of two pages of all we have. There's the second page about tennis for two. Now, since I flipped accidentally this one, I'll start with it. Uh, the, the, the circuit uh, has got a power supply. I won't talk about that. That's pretty simple. It's up at the top. Uh, very common. These, this network in the middle here, uh, what it does, it, on the left side, you have a left and a right side. The left side is vibrating. It's making a clock signal and then it, the right side's dividing it, and some outputs come out of it, and there, so one of three lines is active at one time, and those lines will produce a line on the bottom for the court, uh, then it switches, and then maybe the vertical net is displayed, 
and then the other line, when it's enabled, will make the ball display wherever the ball is on the screen. And it's happening, you know, one after another very quickly. Um, I, I decided I'd make it go fast enough so dogs could watch the ball, because it turns out dogs can't really watch TV like we can. They, they see a flicker. And so I want, I don't know that any dogs have watched my ball yet, but I did it anyway. Um, so I followed this circuitry quite, uh, I couldn't do it exactly because if you look really close, these are PNP transistors and they're not made anymore. I can only get NPNs, really. So I had to flip the circuit upside down and change the polarities and make adjustments. But basically I did, a, reproduced all of this circuitry plus a little more because I wanted to have a little more control over timing. Um, this over here is the actual switching circuitry, which I just mentioned, you're switching the ball, the court, and so on. Uh, I did not reproduce this exactly because I looked at it and it depends on the low bias volt drop out of a germanium transistor, and I use silicon transistors. So this particular circuit uh, implemented with more modern devices would have more, some distortion that they really didn't have to worry about. But th this is just kind of uh, supporting the basic uh, game circuitry. And this is where, to me, things get interesting. Because these little triangles here are all internal to that Cistron daughter computer, analog computer. And in a way, back in the day, they had it a lot easier because they could use plugs and plug, re you know, change the connections and find the right ones a lot easier than I can. Because nowadays with things being so small, how do you make sure that your design is correct before you spend a whole bunch of money building it and getting mistakes? It's something an engineer spends a bit of time worrying about. And um, I had to basically do this, get this whole thing and have a lot of confidence that it was going to work before I ordered the circuit board and had it, all the, sur the surface mount components mounted onto it. Anyway, uh, this is very interesting to me because it, through the years, whenever I, I saw the words analog computer, I would stop and find out what was going on. It's something that has always interested me, like what were they used for, how did they work, and what these circuits are doing is they're implementing some mathematics that simulates real, real world Newtonian physics. So the ball goes in an arc, yeah, it's affected by gravity, there's even a, uh, some accounting for wind resistance, and the way I implemented it, it, it even accounts for some time spent on the ground bouncing. So it's a very exact uh, representation of real-world physics. So, since I'm trying to reproduce the, whole, the, the essential spirit of the game, but in modern components, the first thing I had to do was really study what was going on. And, and so, uh, the same one here. I spent, this is uh, where I just am analyzing and I'm looking at how things work, uh, it's kind of small, so I'm not going to really explain a lot in detail where, where things are, but um, no, sorry about that. What I found right away was over on, on the left side here, there's this line that's controlling all these relays. And the problem is, as I said, this is not as built. This is all drawn from memories years after the um, open house, the first open house in 1958. And the way it's drawn is that would mean that both players are pushing the button at the same time, which is impossible. So the logic controlling the game, I didn't trust any of this. I had to come. I came up with it all on my own. I actually took a little microprocessor and put some LEDs on it and some switches and I made, and the LEDs represented different states I wanted to be in. And I spent the time 
writing code that had logic instructions in it so I could reproduce the logic and getting everything right before I, I um, you know, spent the money to make the board. But, so most of these notes, you know, I just made to myself. I wish I'd stopped doing that. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm analyzing the game. I'm looking at what the different circuits do so that I can reproduce the function. Now, it's, the, back in the day, things were done totally different. Like, there, for a comparator, he's got an amplifier that's driving the coil of the relay. So if the voltage on the coil, the relay gets high enough, it's going to snap closed. Well, that's, you don't do, do, do anything like that anymore. So, but understanding what was happening, like here, there's um, two of them, and there's, they're connected by these diodes. So they're either detecting the uh, ends of the court or they're detecting the net. There's kind of a similar, I just make the, the net very, very thin, you know. And uh, so this led to my own designs. And this one, you know, I can't read any of this, but um, basically this should be, should be the vertical section. Let's see. Can, It's embarrassing if I stop and consult with my, my own here, and I won't do that. But, and it jumped on me again. I just want to cover the essential characteristics about what's going on. Over here, this is either the horizontal or vertical. I, well, I think it's the vertical section on my first page. And I got to lift my finger off this. Though the first two pages are essentially very similar, one's horizontal, one's vertical. This one is vertical, I see, because up here I recognize that it's accounting for gravity. You can only do that in the up-down direction. So what's happening here is a player presses a button, and the voltage they have on each control is, the, is dual gang pot, and the voltage they have selected is transfer is is on a capacitor and that capacitor goes from being belonging to the controller to belonging to the actual gain and that the voltage on that capacitor represents speed in the in this case the vertical direction and that's on on this output now what happens is you know the ball drops and eventually it hits the ground and when it does, this circuit, this here with this capacitor actually flips over and reverses the charge of this speed capacitor. So it goes from plus to minus at a little bit less to account for some loss in the bounce, which is adjustable, and then the ball bounces. Now, one of the things, like I mentioned already, that in the Things are getting harder and harder to do from a construction point of view because things are getting smaller and smaller and you basically have to make a whole circuit board now to test, test the design where before you put everything together by hand and you could test out little sections. So I spent, like I say, a lot of time uh, testing the game and one of the things I found, I found the game had a flaw. And I, I also spent some time watching some videos of Brookhaven's actual reproduction where they actually reproduced it the old way where they and they spent a lot more time doing it that way than I had to and um, I watched their screen carefully and they had the same flaw and what it, I came up with to get around it was there's this one output of this comparator that that um, it tells it if it goes below ground if it goes into a I call it the gopher hole so uh, what, what can happen is, see the physics of this thing will account for a ball bouncing, but when the ball bounces, you know, eventually it starts to roll at, at the very end. And there's nothing in this electronics that can account for a roll when it runs out of bounce. So when it ran out of bounce, it would drop through the floor and keep going. So here I detect it and reset the game to the serve position because at that point, that's where you want to be anyway. So that was one of two flaws that I found in the game. The other one is still there, and on, if we ever go to another iteration, well, I'll fix it. 
So um, what happens here is if the ball is found to, to hit the floor, which is this, this comparator detects that, then it sends a signal to this timer, which sends a pulse out to reverse the, the capacitive charge here to change the polarity of the input velocity so the ball bounces. And that's about it for that page. Now, there's another page here. It's basically very similar, except there's no gravity. Um, I did mention there is another equivalent. This is also on the other page. This resistor here accounts for wind resistance. Uh, but the rest of it's very similar. You have some comparators here that are determining, determining net crossing and near the end of the, at the end of the court. You reach the end of the court, it's going to reset the game to the serve position. If it crosses the net, then you no longer can hit the... You can only hit the ball once anyway, but the other person can't hit the ball until it gets on their side of the net, and that's what happens here. Now, I'm kind of proud of this the way I implemented the uh, integration here that turns velocity into uh, position because the game could be in one of two states. It's not quite true it's all analog. It is somewhat digital because there are two bits <laughs> of memory in this thing. One controls whether or not you're playing or you're, it's waiting for you to serve the ball and the other one determines which side of the net the ball is on. And uh, when you're in the serve position, this center amplifier is not, you don't want it to do anything. And so going through a switch and having it, I, I turn it into a voltage follower, so it just follows ground. It was important to me not to have it go to an extreme up or down position because it could take some time to recover once you re-engage the game. So here it's stays in kind of an active mode even though you do some switching. And I, I also have to mention that had I tried to use these components to build the game into the original size using the old relays, I would have had big problems because the performance of the parts I used is way beyond what they had back then. And that would have caused some, some extra components to have to quiet things down. And Next, up on top, is basically the mirrored version of that timing circuit with some more stuff in the middle that I kind of borrowed from a computer monitor circuit that I was working on ex actually at the time also for the museum. I was restoring some Alto um, monitors and it, the point of this center stuff thing is none of it I've actually done yet. Uh, if I to get the time to actually tune things up the way I like to. I have a lot of other things I'm doing at the museum and you know, just spending too much time on this doesn't make me feel right. I can really, you know, I like doing it. It's important in itself, but I've got lots of stuff to do. So uh, this, uh, there's a lot of tuning in of the different components that really never got done and it's yet to be done. And the whole point is this center section gave me more control of I wanted to get the brightness of the ball, the net, and the court the same because they're different sizes, and even, but they're on at the same length of time. So by controlling that, I would, uh, you know, ideally uh, improve the game. Um, in the center here, to make the net in the original game, they, they took part of the 60 cycle hertz and they just used that to, to wipe in the uh, vertical direction and in the horizontal direction for the court, holding the other X, Y, you know, you got hold the X constant, vary the Y, or vice versa for the, hold the uh, Y constant, vary the X for the, for the court. Um, I didn't use a transformer, you know, because this is all solid state stuff, so I, I didn't want to add a transformer to do it the same way they did, besides which, I thought doing it with a sine wave uh, sawtooth generator would be better because it's more uniform brightness. So that's what I've got going on here. This is a circuit to uh, make the, the, the make it go this way, then draw the cord and make it go up and down for the net. 
and you can see that um, there's a recti some rectification going on because you only want the net to go from the ground up whereas the court goes all the way across and right there at, at the bottom of the net is the zero whether you're going plus or minus now this lower thing is interesting and I'm actually quite proud of this because I had to, I came up with this myself I saw varieties that circuits that are similar I, and I did a lot of looking but they didn't have quite what I wanted to have and what I wanted to have was what this circuit does it makes a sine and cosine function that are locked together one a sine and cosine and it does it they're very accurate they're very low harmonic distortion and the circuits I was looking at didn't have the performance I wanted so I came up with this and it worked very very good because there's one thing I had to do for this game that the original game didn't have to worry about and that is th this game is on permanent exhibit at the museum as you go up up a stairway so basically it's on eight hours a day six days a week five days a week yeah it's on you know and it, so it gets its use whereas the original game was meant for an open house that's it that's all and you didn't have to worry about burning a hole in the screen I had to worry about that a little bit. I knew just having a dot for a ball um, wouldn't really be a good idea and that it would probably ruin the screen. So one of the things, I haven't seen it, and I, I, but I did uh, read about it in a reference, is the Sistron Donner instruction manual, which probably inspired the idea for the game, told you how you could wire that analog computer up to make a bouncing ball. And I read that, or I had heard about it, because actually uh, one of the people at the museum saw an exhibit of this at, I think, the uh, Computer History Museum. And she told me about it, and that as soon as she told me, she said, oh, I know how to do that, because I was working on this, and obviously I did know how to do that. And you just have a sine and cosine, and you couple them together, and uh, it draws a circle. And the ball, it goes at 10 kilohertz. I draw the ball really fast, so the edges of the ball, when they hit the net or the ground, the fact that it has to come around is really irrelevant. It, it behaves like it's perfectly round. So, um, no, did I flip that again? Yeah. Well, it was time anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I, th there's that. Now, up here, this, is a, this chip is just selecting the ball, the net, or the, or the uh, ground again, the cord again, and it replaces that weird circuit that I didn't want to use because I was afraid of the distortion that it would cause. Uh, down at the bottom is the logic. Now, if you, or if there's anybody who's a digital logic enthusiast out there, <laughs> there's the one, okay. Well, you'll recognize the flip-flops here. So there's, there's one bit of memory, and here's the other bit of memory. There's some logic to, uh, you know, you, you uh, press the buttons to hit the ball and uh, that logic's buffered here and it's controlled by the input that says which side of the court the ball's on because only one player can be enabled at the time. And um, then the last slide before this one just shows the power supply. Uh, I used a lot of capacitors to make a very quiet I didn't, I didn't want transients messing things up. I probably worried about this part more than I needed to. And also the connectors, how things hook up. Now, the way I did this because of the issue of, you got to do a lot of tuning of things, uh, but how do you do that in surface mount components? Again, which most consumer electronics is, right? Uh, through whole computer components are getting harder and harder to find. Um, and I've noticed that just from the time I've been working at the museum. So what I, I do, this is one of my tricks, is the board is mixed. It has both surface mount and through hole components. And what I tried to do is identify wood circuits. I'm going to have to like change values on and play around with to get it to work right. And which ones I can just take as is with a lot of confidence. And so that's a criteria that by which I had uh, made the decision of which uh, kind of part to use. So on the one side here, you can see the board as I got it after I ordered it. I had some parts put on at an assembly house. So this is the way it is. I see the board for the first time. 
Um, then here, and you can actually see, I've been playing around with changing some values or some junk over here where I've got some, uh, you know, resistors soldered together. I'm trying to do something. And these red things are the capacitors that were being, holding the charge, switching things back and forth. And uh, I think that's about it. Okay. Well, that's kind of just a, a sum, summarize and kind of lessons learned. Yeah. And, um, oh, here's the thing. The, board, the game does have the flaw, and it's that you can be 30 feet tall and hit the ball. You, you wind up playing and the ball can just work its way up. So in a, if there's another iteration of the game, what I'll be doing is I'll be adding uh, one more compa uh, comparator, which is down in this direction, right? Where I had the gopher hole, I also need um, something that here there be giants, you know, or something, so that you can only hit the ball if it's within six feet of the ground or something like that. And that should make the game much more playable. I have found out the, the game, uh, if you have everything right, the game is actually very, a lot of fun to play, and it's a, it's a real experience. If things aren't tuned up right, then it's not so great. Uh, and the actual controller, uh, getting the components in that, the, getting the values in that correct makes a huge difference on how playable the game is. The um, game out by the front door is pretty playable, uh, but I actually have made up this controller that has two extra knobs on it, and I'm trying to get somebody to use it and figure out for me how to set the knob so I can take those values, turn them into fixed values inside the controller, and make the game more playable. So that's where things are now. Um, you know, it was done for an exhibit, so I essentially did the board well enough so that it could be used the first time around. That's not to say I didn't make any mistakes. There are three tiny wiring mistakes where I had to cut and jump and, and make little corrections on that board. But for a board of this complexity, that's, no, that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's actually pretty good. You know, there's a, it covers four pages of schematics, you just saw them, and there's quite a few parts there. So trying to get all that right so it would work the first time, like, you know, it's not easy to do. So at th this point, I'll, I'll wrap things up and just ask for questions. So any, anything anybody want to know about? Yes. I, I'm not hearing you very well. Can you come? I'm sorry, there's just so much noise out there. That oh, no, the ball doesn't rotate. You can't have any. That's pretty fine. That's an interesting idea, but. Uh, yeah, as far as putting English on the ball, no. Uh, the actual controller, all, you, all the original controller does is vary the position. It has two potentiometers in it, and you rotate them on a common shaft. So when it's sent over, over one direction, you have all horizontal hit. All the force goes horizontally. Turn it all the way the other way, then it goes straight up. Now, I didn't make it quite go straight up, you know, and one day I go downstairs and the ball's actually hopping backwards and I say, the game can't do that. The potentiometer's bad. It's, it, the wipers lifted off. And, that, you know, of course, I was right. You know, I know the game well enough to know that. Wait a minute, it can't go backwards. <laughs> so, but it's, you know, it, what you're talking about would be another level of complexity. It's, it's an interesting idea. What was the most challenging aspect uh, of designing the new board? So, of, of looking at the difference between the analog components and the digital components, and you had to make the decisions. So what, what do you think was the most challenging part about 
designing the newest, the new board, all around design. The most challenging thing is just to get everything right. So like, you got this output, it's supposed to go positive, which drives this one, which actually turns things upside down, goes negative, and then it comes over here and hits the comparator, and you go, do you want to go at a positive going transition or a negative going transition, and getting the logic, everything, that was the big issue to me was, you know, there's going to be a, a day when I'm going to go to work and I'm going to order the board and I'm going to spend like $3,000 of the boss's money and, you know, we don't want junk. You know, and if, if it is junk, it better be fixable junk. And fortunately, this was not junk. It worked out pretty well. So, and actually, and actually things were done, surprisingly, on time. It was working when the museum opened, and that was... I, shall I confess about the first time that's ever happened to me? <laughs> yeah, it, it, things like this, it, it's a can of worms. You start working on it, and, you know, it's like the Easter egg that finds another Easter egg inside of it. It just goes on and on and on. And, and um, you know, just preparing the talk, you know, I, 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 I reviewed some things and like found some more stuff out, you know, like, you know, I mentioned yeah, Willie H Higginbotham, you, sh you should get a lot of credit for doing this because nobody else did it and it could have been done 10 years earlier. But I, you know, that was kind of yesterday when I was tracing, see, I know op amps were invented in 1945, let's see, oh no, they were invented in 1941, <laughs> I was wrong. So, you know, it's, but that's what I like to do. I like to, to uh, you know, get really deeply involved in things and, and uh, then it comes time to remind me that it has to be done by a certain time. <laughs> but it, it, it is, it, this game is a lot of fun. It, it uh, you know, analog computers solved a lot of problems for a long time and, you know, they're pretty much gone because digital computers our competition and pretty much wiped them out. But really, this game, from a technical point of view and a performance point of view, nothing was done, could could possibly have done using any other technique for better for like 10 or 15 years. Now we're getting into virtual reality and stuff. So you could, gee, you could actually make a virtual reality game of tennis for two. You know, it works just. As, but you know that that's that's now. That 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 wasn't. You know, we're. Retro games back in the 80s. This thing performs as well as something you'd see from the 80s. It was done in 1958. Uh, it was done by the open house. First time, by the way, it was a huge success. I guess there were there was a, a, a line around the building like three times. They also did it in 1959, but they kind of screwed up. And and uh, it kind of tells me they weren't quite. It wasn't quite as successful the second time around because they, they decided to change things up a little bit and they didn't really think things through because, you know, having, I can speak with authority on this since I've implemented the game. Uh, in 1959, they had a version that you could uh, play like with, with, like the game was on Jupiter or you could play like it was on Earth or you could play like it was on the moon. Well. You build a game, it's really only good for the Earth. Because if you try to play it on simulate Jupiter gravity, the ball goes straight down into the ground. That's not very much fun. If you try to simulate playing on the moon, you hit the ball and the ball goes and 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 goes right out of the court. So there's no game there either. So having built the game and played with the, with the uh, issues and then looking at, there's a, that very first picture where I show the, the game on the table. That essentially, in 1959, it was kind of the same thing, but a little different. And um, yeah, it just, it, they were, I think, hoping, thinking it would work the same way, as, be as successful as it was the first time around. But as I mentioned, the control, the components and getting everything right make a huge difference on the playability. So uh, before you mentioned uh, with Here Be Giants, you were saying that might be a flaw in the game. 
I've actually seen people demoing the game really enjoyed that. That was their favorite part of the game, that they could hit it up into the sky and just hit it back and forth. So just a feedback note there. Uh, okay, maybe that needs to be an option with a switch so you could turn it on and off. Well, that's the thing, that's important, you know. You, you know, it's not for me to build it the way I want to. I want to build it the way it makes people happy. So, you know, make it playable. So if they like that, that's, that's, that's great. I still think it's kind of a flaw, though. You, know, you can play, bounce a ball, it keeps, just keeps going higher and higher. All right, well, thank you, Keith, for uh, informing us on the game, and uh, congratulations. I think it's definitely a success to uh, see it on the museum floor and here at the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>